the brutal and bloody 13th century. Whole nations and peoples perish in the countless wars. Apocalypse, the end of the world, the judgment day. Theologians, sages and representatives of different religions believe these disasters to be divine retribution. The largest ever clash of the West and East civilizations is ripening. The united armies of Europe, blessed by the Roman Pontiff, embark upon bloody crusades to liberate the Holy Sepulchre from Saracens in sacred Jerusalem, while the immortal army of Genghis Khan is approaching them in the campaign to reach the so-called Last Sea. The Baghdad Caliphate had already fallen under the hooves of the Mongolian horses. During this terrible time, millions of Muslims throughout the Islamic world were caught between the two fires and were in need of a new pillar of society, a protector and a hero who would save them from the impending doom. If evil breeds throughout the country, Baybars will come at once and justice will prevail. An Egyptian proverb. Our ancestors used to say, sand will never become a rock, slave will never become a leader. But history has always had exceptions. And in this case, the exception happened in the history of this place, Egypt. Here, in the middle of a sandy desert, the legendary pharaohs erected marvelous pyramids and former slaves, called Mamluks, built their empire. This is our history, and one of the brightest personas is a slave who was destined to die a nobody, but by the will of fate became the savior and one of the greatest rulers of the Muslim world and the whole East, Sultan Bivars. Truth is always the same, said once a wise pharaoh. Indeed, sometimes you need to go thousands of kilometers away to better understand your history, from which you cannot take out the words just as you can do that from a song. One needs to get a distance to see the big picture. And from here, from the ancient and mysterious country of Misr, as the Egyptians call it, our true history appears in all its grandeur. It is here, scorched by the blazing sun and caressed by shady oases, bound by shackles and bestowed with power, that the brave sons of the great steppe displayed all their best qualities. They came to Egypt as captive slaves and became its rulers. The Mamluks were guards comprised of slave soldiers from certain ethnic groups. They were the backbone of the Muslim rulers of the East. The first Mamluk guard was formed under the Arab caliphs, who wanted to preserve sole authority. So they established a special institution of the guard, which served only to the caliphs and was independent from the decisions of the state apparatus. This institution existed for many centuries, at least in the Middle Ages, in the Muslim East. Ancient and mysterious Cairo, the city's name translates from the Coptic language as the destroyer of men and the crusher of men. No wonder, both now and in ancient times, Cairo has always been one of the most densely populated, crowded cities in the world. Only the strongest survived here, and only the best of them became successful. Bibars was one of them. Cairo could not break him. Quite the other way around. 
spots today, just as hundreds and thousands of years ago, Cairo is one of the largest centers of international trade. All sorts of good flow here from all over the world, but up to the end of the 19th century, you could easily buy yourself a couple of humans, slaves for domestic needs. And there were dozens of such markets in Cairo. In the 13th century, Egypt was one of the main importers of human commodities. Slaves were brought to the local markets from Africa, the Black Sea, and the Middle East. But those from Dishti Kipchak, as the territory of the modern Kazakhstan was called at the time, were especially valued. So, in 1239, at one of such Egyptian markets, someone bought a 14-year-old Kipchak boy. From medieval Arab, Persian and Turkic authors to the present day, Many have written a great deal about bay bars. Opinions of many researchers vary greatly. One thing that everybody agrees on is that he was a slave, bought at the slave market for 800 dirhams. This is the exact amount that appears in many sources. But how did Bebars and countless other Kipchak boys end up thousands of kilometers away from their home? How did the free men of the steppe end up on the slave markets of Egypt, India and other countries? The answer to this question reveals a dreadful tragedy. The catastrophe for a number of Turkic tribes, peoples and states, especially the Kipchaks, who back then inhabited the territory of modern Kazakhstan. Most of them were conquered by Genghis Khan, who came from the east. And those who did not want to submit to the will of the conqueror had to flee to the west, beyond the Volga and Don rivers, and were captured and sold into slavery. This is confirmed by the data recorded by Sultan Bebars' personal secretary Ibn Shaddad. Based on the words of Bebars' kidman, the Kipchak chief Beysara, here is what he said. Sultan Baybars was born in the country of Kipchaks in the Hijri year of 622-1225. During the Tatar invasion, Baybars tribe pleaded with the Bulgarian Khan Anar to allow them to cross into the Crimean town of Sudak and inhabit those lands. Khan kindly offered them to settle in the Intermountain Basin and during their migration treacherously attacked them, killing many and capturing numerous others. Sultan Baybars' contemporaries, his chroniclers and other medieval authors claim the place of Baybars' birth to be between the Zhayek and Yedel rivers, that is, the Kazakh lands. And given that Baybars was born during the period of the first and major clashes between the Kipchaks and the Mongols on the Kalka River in 1223 and on the Zhayek River in 1229, we can assume that the Kipchak tribe from which he came from was forced to to leave their homes under the pressure of the Mongols and move to the west, where it was completely exterminated. The echoes of that tragedy have reached our times. The Kazakhs have a proverb, sons to Rum, daughters to Crimea, which conveys the fate of our ancestors who mourned their children captured and sold into slavery to the Sultanate of Rum and Crimea. Medieval authors give different accounts on the name of Bebars' native tribe. Some say he belonged to the Yelborlo clan, some to the Berj Ugly clan, others to the Toksova clan. One thing is for sure, all these clans belong to the Kipchak tribe, and they are also mentioned in the old Russian chronicles. There, the Toksova clan is called Toksobichi, Berj Ugly clan, Burchevichi, and Yelborlo clan, Ulberri. The tragic fate of these Kipchak clans is evidenced by the fact that none of them have survived to this day in their original form. We have already determined Baybar's past as a slave and his Kipchak origin. But which tribe did he belong to? The scientists are not on the same page about this matter. According to many sources, Baybar's was from the tribe Birch or Birch. There are different phonetic variations of that tribe name. The Birch tribe has been mentioned in medieval sources since the 10th century. 
long before the formation of the Kazakh Khanate. Later, when the Kazakh Khanate was created, this tribe became part of the junior Jews. We can sum it all up like this. Baybars was a slave from the Great Steppe, from the Kipchak clan, and he belonged to the Bersh tribe. Most of the Kipchaks, especially those who lived in the western Kazakhstan, the Aral Sea region, the Cuman field, which includes the South Russian and South Ukrainian steppes, as well as the steppes adjacent to the Northern Caucasus, fought against the Mongols, which predetermined their tragic fate. Kipchak captives were mostly bought by the Egyptian rulers to form their personal troops. They were called Mamluks. Thus, the Mamluks became a separate military caste, the first professional regular army in the world. And the Kipchak, Turkic people, were the best – fearless warriors, natural horsemen and skillful archers. It is important to understand what our ancestors were like, how they fought. For example, all my life I read books in Arabic about Baybars and, comparing it with the Soviet sources, I was displeased with the phrasing the white slave. Soviet scholars translated Mamluk as the white slave. There had never been slavery or slave ownership in Kazakhstan. We were always free. The nomadic way of life contributed to the fact that the nomads had incredible combat skills. And this can be traced even in the Muslim and Arabic sources. It says, don't bother the Turkic people until they bother you. This expression allegedly belongs to Muhammad, but it is most likely a legend. Expressions like that do exist. Far to the east live the Turkic peoples. They are the last hope of Islam. That's why the Turkic tribes were considered very skillful warriors. The uniqueness of the Mamluk Kipchaks lies in the fact that thousands of kilometers away from their native land, while remaining a total minority compared to the local indigenous population, they did not assimilate, did not dissolve in it. They managed to preserve their language, customs and traditions. They kept their national costume, traditional cuisine, drank fermented mare's milk, kept the original Turkic military art, weaponry and music. Also, during military maneuvers or campaigns, they still used to live in yurts. Sultan Bibars's personal secretary, Ibn Abdel Zahir, mentioned an interesting fact in his notes, which very vividly described the attitude of the Mamluks to their culture and history. Here is what he wrote. The Sultan went to Giza in the month of Shaban, which comes before the month of Ramadan. There he stayed near the pyramids. He was horseback riding and shooting arrows. His arrows flew over the pyramids. A group of people climbed to the top, and the assistant of Bey Koshtimir set up a harakeh there. The harakeh stood there for many days. Here, the word harakeh means the traditional Kazakh yurt, the hulk of which Kazakhs to this day call kirige. And in some regions of Kazakhstan, the word kirige is an older synonym for the word yurt. The steppe people not only avoided assimilation with the local population, but also had a great influence on Egyptian culture, in particular, the Arab Muslim culture in general. They all went to the Kipchak steppes and found wives there. They did not marry Egyptian women. Sultan Kalawin is a proof to that. He never spoke Arabic. He only used the Kipchak language. That's why a special Arab Kipchak dictionary was written. For example, as scholars of Arabic studies, we all know that in Saudi Arabia, Emirates, Jordan, Syria, the word bridge is translated as Jisr. But here in Egypt, when you ask around, nobody will understand the word Jisr. They will say Kupri. This is the Kipchak word Kupr. The Kazakh words Kupr, Balta, Kurek and many others are familiar to people in Egypt. Therefore, we have to understand that the Kipchaks not only blended into this culture, they brought their own step. Why do we keep mentioning Kipchaks and not Turkics in most cases? 
That is because at that time there was a huge state formation called Deshti Kipchak, which in Russian sources is called Polovtsian Field, while in European sources it is Kumenia. At that time Kipchak language was the language of international communication. It was a very rich language like modern English or lingua franca. Our Kazakh professor Alexander Garkovets published an impressive folio based only on written medieval Kipchak monuments. This implies how prestigious the Kipchak language was. In Egypt of the Mamluk times, Arabic literary language was not the only language that was spoken. The so-called Kipchak Oguz language was also widespread. This means that the Kipchaks also had some influence on the language of Egyptians. And some documents serve as a proof. There is a document that for the first time mentioned the word Kazakh, which is now an ethnonym of the modern Kazakh people. The Cossack also has the same origin. Back then the word did not imply an ethnic name, but a social status of a person. It stood for a free human. An outcast and so on. It is mentioned for the first time in Egypt in the Turkic Arabic Dictionary of 1245. The Mamluks period of training ranged through three to five years. Boys bought at slave markets were converted to Islam taught the basics of the religion, put through physical training, learned military science, tactics and fighting strategy. Upon completion of the training, each Mamluk had to master several types of weapons and martial arts, know how to provide first aid, have skills of survival in difficult climate conditions, maintain strict discipline and follow the chain of command. The Mamluks with such military skills quickly became the elite, the backbone of the Egyptian army and the best warriors in their time. The Roda Island is located in the center of Cairo, in the middle of the Nile River, sacred to the Egyptians. Today the island is filled with modern buildings, but in the 13th century it was a home for the training camp, barracks and a fortress of the Turkic Mamluks. It was here that young Bibars began his noble path. Enrolled in the Mamluk garrison, he immediately proved himself as a brave warrior and a talented commander. The Mamluks living on the island were called Bahri, which means Sea Mamluks. Because at that time the Egyptians called the Nile itself Bahr, meaning the sea, out of respect. It was Beybars who founded the so-called Bahri dynasty of Egyptian sultans of the Turkic origin, who were ruling the country for almost 150 years. Roda Island was a pillar of the Mamluk warriors' training. The Center for Warrior Training and Accommodation was founded by Sultan Salah al-Din Ayyub. However, under his successors, the barracks and the fortress of Roda fell into decay. And when Sultan Bibars came to power, he restored all the buildings and strengthened the island, thus strengthening the training of Bahri Mamluk. Many researchers clearly believe that the Bahri were Kipchaks. Baybars belongs to the Bahri dynasty, and some believe that the Burji are of Circassian origin. Although I doubt it, because even among those Burji Mamluks, who later became emirs, there are such names as Kaitbai, Janbolat, Lashin, Barisbai. These names clearly indicate their Kipchak origin. In fact, the Kipchak ethnic group and the Kipchak statehood that were scattered all over the world and wiped off the face of the earth were still preserved and existed for another century and a half in Egypt. 
Moreover, under the leadership of Bebars, the Kipchak Mamluks saved Egypt itself in that cruel 13th century. First, from the invasion of crusaders from the west, and then from the attack of Mongols from the east. In this respect, with their vision they made Egypt prosper. Up to this day, on the 800th anniversary, all Egyptians keep starting the history of Baybars as a golden age. Now all of us, the Kazakhs, should know it too, because his homeland is on the shore of the Caspian Sea. Egyptian scientists confirm it. Therefore, we want to recreate all his heroic battles, which he fought on the one hand with the Mongols and on the other with the Crusaders. His troops were low in numbers, but they were very well trained in military combat, so to speak. Bibars' fame as a brave warrior and talented commander first came up in battles with the Crusaders. He became one of the primary commanders who led the Egyptian army into the war against the combined forces of the Knights of Europe when the French King Louis IX launched the Seventh Crusade to liberate Jerusalem from the Saracens, which is what the Muslims were called in the West. Egypt was then ruled by Sultan Saleh of the Ayyubid dynasty which was founded by the famous Salah al-Din. However, by the time of the Crusader invasion, Sultan Salih fell seriously ill and soon died. Upon taking charge of the defense of the city of Al-Mansur, Bibars immediately showed the qualities of an outstanding commander. He evaded the battle, lured the Crusaders into the city, ambushed and exterminated almost the entire enemy army. According to the chroniclers, by the end of the battle, at the city of Al-Mansur, only five Templar knights survived. The remaining Crusader army was doomed and began to retreat. But the Mamluks caught up with them and crushed them in the Battle of Fariskur in the northern Egypt. All these events are not only described, but also illustrated in detail in the European chroniclers of that time. King Louis IX was captured by the Mamluks, and the heir of Sultan Salih, Turan Shah, was killed in Fariskur by his emirs Aybek, Aktai, Kalawun, and Beybars. This way, the reign of the Ayyubid dynasty ended, and the throne of Egypt was taken by the Mamluks. The Mamluks, led by Baybars and his heir Kalawin, finished them off and forced them out entirely. But in fact, the Mamluks were in the position of defense. It should be said that they tried to make an alliance with the Mongols, because Mongols were not Muslims. So it was acceptable to ally with them, at least in the Middle East. After the defeat of Louis IX, the kings and knights of Europe will no longer be able to organize any major crusades, and their power in the region will gradually come to naught. Mostly thanks to the efforts of Sultan Bibars, who liberated the cities and fortresses of the entire Middle East and North Africa from the Crusaders one by one. However, after thwarting the Seventh Crusade, Egypt and the entire Muslim world faced a new threat called the Yellow Crusade. And it was coming not from the west, but from the east. Having established the Ilkhanate within the Mongol Empire on the conquered lands of Persia, Caucasus and Asia Minor, Kulagu, the grandson of Genghis Khan, aspired to conquer all of the Near East. After invading Baghdad and executing the Caliph, he issued an ultimatum to the Sultan of Egypt, Qutuz. The great lord chose Genghis Khan and his clan and bestowed upon us all the countries on this earth. Everyone who refused to obey us has ceased to exist, along with the wives, children, relatives, slaves and cities, as everyone should know. And the rumor of our boundless army has spread like the tales of Rostam and Esfandiar. So if you obey our majesty, send the tribute, come and ask for a governor, or else prepare for war. When the ambassadors came and offered Kutuz to surrender, he said, we have already lost one homeland, there is nowhere else to go, there are only sands and the Sahara Desert further on, so we must endure and win. 
Following the advice of Bebas, his closest associate and the most influential Mamluk emir at that time, Qutuz executed the ambassadors. Egypt began preparing for the war. And soon enough, Bibars led the Mamluk army into battle and smashed the Mongols, led by Commander Ketbuga, in the Battle of Ain Jul. It's important to know that Bibars and his Kipchaks were not the first or the only Turkic warriors in the Middle East and Egypt. Previously, the army of Salah al-Din consisted mostly of them too. And now the Turkic warriors came face to face in a fierce battle thousands of kilometers away from their native steppe. However, Bebars turned out to be an outstanding commander and strategist. He inflicted the first major defeat on the Mongols and stopped their advance westward. Sultan Bebars is the real founder of the Mamluk state. Despite the fact that Qutuz was officially the Sultan at that time, today Egyptian historians unanimously and unequivocally consider Bebars to be the first true founder of the Mamluk state and their unconditional leader. And the Battle of Ain Jalut is a proof of that, because it was Bebars who led the army. He was the one who commanded the Mamluks and fought bravely in that battle. It was solely thanks to the talent of the commander and professional bravery of Bibars that the Mamluks were able to defeat the Mongols in the first battle of Ain Jalut and were inspired by this victory. After the victory at Ain Jalut, the history of Faris Kur repeated itself. Sultan Turan Shah treated his emirs unfairly, trying to diminish the role of the Mamluks in the victory over the Crusaders, and was killed because of that. This time, the same mistake was made by Qutuz. He wanted to diminish the merits of his commander Bebars and steal the credit of this victory all to himself. Bebars, realizing his power in the support of his warriors, made a decisive move and killed Sultan Qutuz. The Mamluks and the people supported him. Thus, Kipchak Bibars became the Sultan of the country of Misr. Bibars's ascension to the Egyptian throne was a notable event for his contemporaries and was widely publicized. Here is how various authors wrote about it. A certain Guillaume of Tripoli wrote, the ruler of Egypt became a Turkic named Bondogar. In the Irfurt Chronicle, Bibars is mentioned as the Sultan of Babylon and the Pharaoh of Egypt, a Turkic by origin and Menhasar al-Zahir by name. The Acts of St. Cyprian report, the Sultan was one of the Mamluks who are neither Egyptian nor Arab. According to Hayton of Coricus, the Sultan is descended from the Kuman. While in Egypt itself, Ibn Abdul Zahir wrote the following. All the people unanimously believed that at that time there was no man more courageous, no commander more gifted than him. This is proven by his life path. He ascended to the throne only through personal courage and the power of the sword. In turn, William of Tripoli noted that, as a military commander, Bibars is on par with Julius Caesar. Upon acquiring power, Bibars did not abandon the affairs of war. He waged an active and successful struggle on two fronts. Apparently, his opponents, the Crusaders and the Mongols, acted together. There are documented facts of diplomatic contacts and relations between European monarchs and Hulagus Ilkhanate. Bibars also looked for a strong ally and found Birkia Khan of Olus of Jochi, that is, the Golden Horde. By the will of fate and thanks to her personal ambitions, having occupied the throne of Egypt Bibars, from the habitual to him thick of battles, found himself in the thick of the real world politics and diplomacy. And here he also shows himself as a very pragmatic and far sighted politician and diplomat. Having established friendly relations with the Byzantium, through Constantinople he establishes a permanent ambassadorial connection with Sarai, the capital of the Golden Horde. Bibars's diplomatic talent allows him to drive a wedge between the grandsons of Genghis Khan, cousins Birke and Hulagu, using Using their religious differences. Hulagu was interested in Buddhism, and most of his elite were Christians, while Birke Khan embraced Islam and supported Muslims. Bibars skillfully used these circumstances to create an alliance with the Golden Horde against Hulagu. 
The following letter, written by Beybars to Berke Khan, proves once again that all means are good in diplomacy as well as in war. Sultan Beybars understood it perfectly well. Here is what he wrote. There have already been several news that for the sake of his wife and because of the fact that she is a Christian, Hulagu accepted the religion of the cross. He preferred honoring the faith of his wife to your religion and allowed the Catholics to settle in the dwellings of the caliphs, putting his wife above you. Bibars accompanied his provocative letters with generous gifts for Berke Khan and his entourage. Thanks to chroniclers of Bibars, lists of valuable gifts sent to the embassy in Sarai have been preserved. For example, one of the preserved lists include the Quran written in gold, items made of gold, silver and precious stones, elephants, giraffes, monkeys, zebras, peacocks, parrots and other exotic animals, Arabian sabers, French armor, Khorasmian saddles, lanterns made of Venetian glass, carpets, clothes with gold embroidery, Chinese porcelain, and various sweets. In addition to books, clothes, food and animals, some skilled cooks, footmen and other servants were also sent to the Golden Horde. By this time, the Mongolian elite ruling in the Golden Horde was already under a strong influence of Kipchaks. By the 14th century, Kipchak language had already become predominant. Mongolian was preserved mainly as a prestigious language of the conquerors of the world, etc. The rulers of Mamluk Egypt also consisted of these Kipchaks. Such circumstances contributed to rapprochement. Later, the adoption of Islam also served that purpose, because the descendants of Hulagu adopted Islam much later, at the very end of the 13th century. These things led to the unity of the two nations, and they actually became allies. Bibars significantly expanded the borders of Egypt. He established his authority over the entire Syria and eastern coast of the Mediterranean Sea up to modern Turkey, nearly banishing all the crusaders from the region. Egyptian historian and contemporary of the Sultan al-Makrizi reports that on the short time under Bibars' rule, the Mamluks were able to capture about 50 cities and fortresses, formerly belonging to the crusaders. An interesting fact is that during the reign of the Mamluks, Muslim historians historians and chroniclers called their country Daulat al-Turk, i.e. the state of the Turkics. And the famous medieval historian al nuwayri left the following record about the country of the Mamluks in his work. The Turkic state originally appeared on the land of Egypt and then spread over the regions of Sham, Halep, and up to the Euphrates River. Having subdued the Mediterranean fortresses and Ismaili strongholds, it reached the borders of Ram. It included Yemen and Hijaz. Jordan, modern Israel. By the way, the cities of Mecca and Medina also came under their rule, which elevated their status in the Muslim world. Part of Yemen and part of modern Libya in the Mediterranean area was also included in their territory. It was a huge empire overall. By taking control of the Muslim holy places of Mecca and Medina on the Arabian Peninsula and reviving the Caliphate, which has been destroyed by the Mongols, the Caliph appointed by Baybars was now located in Cairo. Baybars now was on the same level as Salah al-Din himself and was given the title of Rukn al-Din, which means the defender of the faith or the pillar of religion. It was Sultan Baybars who revived the Hajj, the annual pilgrimage to the holy places, which was disrupted after the Mongol invasion. It is possible that Berke Khan and subsequent Khans of the Golden Horde converted to Islam under Bibarsh's personal influence. At least, that is what their letters to the ruler of Egypt indicate. Arab historians of the Middle Ages, as well as the modern ones, say one thing, that Baybars elevated and protected the Islamic world from invasion. Upon his visit to Astana, the Grand Sheikh of Al-Ajjar even said that Baybars protected them. Secondly, he united all the divided kingdoms, including Saudi Arabia, which back then was called the Kingdom of Hijaz. He took it upon himself to fulfill the mission of the custodian of the two holy mosques, Al-Haramayn, Al-Sharifayn. 
No one before him had such a high title. And not only he was proud of this title, but he helped all pilgrims, Egyptians and other people to travel to Mecca and Medina. After each victory, they always performed a Hajj. His spirit united everyone around him. All the small countries such as Syria, Lebanon and part of historical Palestine. He brought freedom, liberated people and hoisted the green flag of Islam everywhere. The influence of the Mamluk state on neighboring countries and peoples was not solely military. They had a great cultural impact on Egypt and the whole Muslim world. They introduced many innovations to Islamic culture and art. They preserved, improved and strengthened it. It is thanks to the Mamluks that Islam and the Muslim world, including millions of Muslims, have survived as part of universal civilization. Firstly, he defended the independence of Egypt, protected the country from the Mongol conquest. It was a tragedy for the Islamic world. And the Mongols and the destruction caused by them are still remembered through fables. So, this was the hope of the Islamic world, which Baybars duly fulfilled. He laid the foundations for the creation of a powerful state, a mighty empire in Egypt. And we must also give him the credit for keeping Egypt on the world map. Al-Azhar University in Cairo, it is one of the first institutions of higher education in the world history. It was founded back in the 10th century and has been the main center of Islamic education ever since. However, in the 13th century, the university fell into decline. The few people know that it was Sultan Baybars who completely restored both the university building and mosque, as well as its importance throughout the Muslim world. Moreover, he rebuilt the destroyed buildings and built new mosques and madrasas in every city liberated from the Crusaders and Mongols. He is one of the first who created the school of four madhabs, the schools of thought within Islam. Hanafi, Hanbali and other madhabs existed equally. Baybars gave them a legal status. Everyone who believed and considered himself a part of the Hanafi Madhab, was a scholar who could dwell on their concerns. Baybars elevated religion to a high level. Secondly, he built numerous mosques. There are everywhere. Even in Cairo itself, there are more than 120 monuments of the Mamluk period of our ancestors. He paid great attention to those warriors who died, building special mausoleums for them. If you take the old Cairo, it is called the Desert of the Mamluks. Sultan Baybars is by far one of the most popular historical figures among Egyptians. Even ordinary people who are not versed in history and do not know the details of Sultan Baybars' life one way or another, know his good name. Because both in Cairo and throughout the country, there are many architectural monuments and facilities associated with him. In the memory of Egyptians, Sultan Baybars remains as one of the greatest generals and fair rulers, who always protected the interests of the common people. Architectural objects built as per the direct order of Bibars can be easily identified by this coat of arms of the Sultan, a snow leopard or a lion, which is depicted on dozens of preserved mosques, fortresses, caravanserais and bridges not only in Egypt but throughout the Middle East. During his reign, Bibars restored the economy of the state. He built bridges and dams, repaired old and laid new irrigation canals developed trade, paid special attention to charity and support of the poor and orphans. Bibars was a good sultan. To this day, the Egyptians still talk about it. One of the most popular literary works in Egypt is considered the epic about Sultan Bibars called Sirat al-Zahir Bibars. The first mentions of this work came from the early 16th century. 
and the Egyptian historian and writer Taha Hussein noted in his memoirs that the epic about Bebars was especially loved by simple peasants. Bebars in this work is shown as a just and honest ruler, protecting his subjects from the misdeeds of government officials and from the enemies. In people's memory, he remained as a hero, although his Turkic origin is not emphasized anywhere. He is considered as a defender of the Arabs, which is the point to be kept in mind. Nevertheless, in the people's memory, he remained as a warrior and protector of the people and their Islamic religion. The legacy of Beybars is alive not only in the memory of Egyptians. In the very center of Cairo, there's a whole district called Al-Zahiriya. Al-Zahir, which means true or fair, is the official title of Beybars. Up to this day, the Egyptians respectfully refer to him as Al-Zahir Beybars. The district of Al-Zahiriya had a madrasa built on the orders of Sultan Beybars. Similar madrasas he built all over the country. It was built in the Mamluk style, recognizable even today, and the Sultan Beybars Mosque in the heart of Cairo was built in the same style. This mosque is not like the usual classical mosque, but it rather resembles a well-fortified stronghold. Sultan Beybars not only gave a personal order to build it, but also took an active part in its construction. The inner courtyard of the mosque is surrounded by four fortress walls. Their sides are about 100 meters in length, and the average height is 10 meters. An interesting fact is that when Napoleon invaded Cairo in 1798, the French turned this mosque into a fortress, placing cannons on its walls. Napoleon named it Fort Sulkovsky, in honor of one of his officers. Later, the mosque building was used as a warehouse, a soap factory and even a slaughterhouse. Thus, despite the high historical and cultural significance of the Sultan Beybars Mosque for the entire Muslim community in general and for the Egyptians in particular, for many years this unique architectural monument was in a deplorable condition on the verge of destruction, despite the fact that the government of Kazakhstan officially allocated money for its restoration. Five years ago, in 2018, we visited Cairo and filled the mosque. It was not functioning and was closed to visitors at that time. Today, thanks to the efforts of the Kazakh side and the Egyptian government, the Al-Zahir Beybars Mosque has been fully repaired and restored. There were different political currents, so most of the financial means we allocated, unfortunately, were spent on unknown purposes. But it was necessary to complete this construction. First of all, we looked for a source of funding. We were greatly assisted by the Minister of Okuf Affairs of Egypt, Dr. Mohamed Juma, from the Treasury of all mosques, which is supervised by the Ministry of Okuf. He allocated enough money and this year, during the holy month of Ramadan, this mosque was ready to open its doors to all visitors. In June 2023, as part of the celebration of the 800th birth anniversary of Sultan Beybars, a solemn reopening of the Sultan Beybars Mosque after restoration took place in the capital of Egypt, Cairo. The Kazakh delegation was led by the chairperson of the Kazakh Senate, Maulian Ashumbayev. The President of Kazakhstan, Kasim Jumar Tokayev, extends warm greetings to all participants of the events dedicated to the 800th anniversary of Sultan Beybars. The head of state attributes special importance to the organization at a high level. More than 600 events have been organized as part of the Jubilee, and some of them are held in Egypt. Relations between the Kazakh and Egyptian people have deep historical roots dating back to the times of the Mamluks. Sultan Beybars, who was a great military leader, at the same time paid special attention to the construction of mosques and madrasas, development of science and education. Sultan al-Zahir Beybars Mosque, which is reopening today after restoration, is rightfully recognized as one of the unique objects of cultural heritage of the world. Therefore, today's event 
is an important one on an international scale. And the name of Sultan Beybars is inscribed in the world history as a wise ruler and a great commander. The 800th birth anniversary of Sultan Beybars is a deeply symbolic and significant event for both the people of Egypt and the Kazakh people. The celebration of the 800th anniversary of Sultan Beybars is important not only for Kazakhstan. This event, as well as the figure of Sultan Beybars, is very important for Egypt and the whole Islamic world. After all, presenting the history of Sultan Beybars to the world, we present the history of our country, its greatness and uniqueness. Undoubtedly, the figure of Sultan Beybars raises our history and the history of the entire Islamic world to a new height. There are many legends about Beybars, but there is only one truth. This expression has been common in Egypt since the times of Sultan Beybars. Yes, the atmosphere of myths, mysteries and riddles has always surrounded not only the life of the legendary Mamluk, but also his death the Sultan of Egypt in Syria, the custodian of the two holy mosques, the defender of the faith and the father of victories. Al-Malik, Al-Zahir, Rukn al-Din Beybars, Al-Bunduk Dari, died in 1277. The cause of his untimely death is shrouded in mystery and various speculations, none of which have been proven but neither have been refuted either. Sultan Beybars was buried not in Cairo, the capital of his empire, but in Damascus and the territory of modern Syria. Beybars himself wanted it that way, did not wish a lavish funeral, but wanted to be buried in a place where his heart would stop beating. In 2003, as the Minister of Culture, Information and Public Accord, I accompanied the Kazakh ambassador to Egypt, Baghdad Amriev, to Damascus, in search of the burial places of Al Farabi and Baybars. We found Baybar's tomb in the largest library complex in Damascus. Which up to this day functions as a library on the one side and as a madrasa on the other. And after this visit, I wrote a letter to the head of state proposing the restoration of this monument. It was approved, and the restoration was carried out by the famous Kazakh restorer Kanat Tuyakbayev. The complex acquired a modern look. During Soviet times, people knew Baybars as a legendary Arab commander, even if he came from our steppe, and they knew him from the works of Maurice Samashka Emshan or the movie Baybars. Today Baybars has become a national hero for many Kazakhs. Sometimes, in order to know your history, to feel the pride for your land and ancestors, you must go thousands of kilometers away, in this case, to Egypt. And if millions of people from all over the world come here to see the pyramids and get acquainted with the history of pharaohs, then for us, the Turkic peoples, and the Kazakhs in particular, Egypt is much closer. After all, it is here that our ancestors, who became legendary Mamluks led by Sultan Beybars, inscribed their names in the history of human civilization. And their legacy, their achievements, feats and accomplishments do not fade even next to the Great Pyramids.